From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS 12 exchanges and six clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome inside the ICE house. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. When we start out the show, I'll often draw a connection between a discussion we're about to have and something happening here at the New York Stock Exchange. But today we're heading up the street to 33 Liberty Street, home of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It's the largest by assets of the 12 regional banks within the Federal Reserve System, the most active by volume and arguably the most influential. While the New York Fed, like the NYSC, was designed in the Renaissance style, it's also designed to be a fortress. Tours of the New York Fed are available to the public, but it's not a history lesson of our nation's fiscal policies, going back to Alexander Hamilton that grabs tourists' attention. No, it's the world's largest depository of monetary gold. 497,000 gold bars with a combined weight of about 6,190 tons. Resting literally on the bedrock of Manhattan, 80 feet below street level and 50 feet below sea level. The Federal Reserve is the gold custodian for account holders such as the U.S. government, other foreign governments, other central banks, and official international organizations. All that gold came here during and after World War II when many countries wanted to store their gold reserves in a safe location. Holdings continued to increase but peaked in 1973 at about 12,000 tons of monetary gold, almost twice what it is now, and it's been in slow decline ever since. Will it fall even further? What will replace it as the reserve asset of the depositors and also institutions and family offices? Cryptocurrencies? Like Bitcoin, perhaps? That might seem a risky bet for While the price of one Bitcoin peaked December 7th, 2017, it fell to as low as about $3,000 a year later. The Bitcoin winter was at full blizzard last Christmas when it approached. And what happened since? Well, it's hit $13,000 again on June 26th. And while it's been gyrating up and down a bit in the days since, it's at levels that many skeptics didn't think it'd see again. I'm reading the Wall Street Journal over the weekend. Britain O'Daly wrote, quote, Bitcoin is booming again, and one of the biggest beneficiaries is a fund that provides everyday investors with access to the world's most popular cryptocurrency. He went on to say that Grayscale Bitcoin Trust had gained 192% in just the second quarter of 2019. No fund performed better during the first half of the year. Grayscale Bitcoin Trust is part of Grayscale Investments, LLC, Founded by our guest today, Barry Silbert, founder and CEO of Digital Currency Group. Barry's not shy about his opinions, and he has lots of opinions about the 497,000 gold bars that sit in the basement of the New York Fed, and about gold in general. They call him the Crypto King, and he has a bone to pick with gold. Our conversation with Barry Silbert about that, and much more, right after this. And now a word from Tufin. NYSE ticker symbol T-U-F-N. We provide policy management for large organizations. Your security is only as good as your policy, and we are the security policy company. So we enable companies to implement network changes in minutes instead of days with dramatically better security. We have over 2,000 customers worldwide. 300 companies in the global 2,000 are Tufin customers. We're going to invest more in R&D, go after this huge market opportunity that we have, and it's very exciting to look at the next phase of Tufin. Considered one of the foremost pioneers in cryptocurrency, Barry Silbert began buying Bitcoin in 2012 and quickly established himself as one of the earliest and most active investors in the industry. He's the founder and CEO of Digital Currency Group, a global enterprise building, supporting, and investing in over 140 companies across the globe, including Coinbase, Ripple, BitPay, and Circle. 
DCG also owns three companies, Grayscale Investments, the largest asset manager in the Bitcoin and blockchain industry, Genesis Trading, the largest regulated OTC crypto trader and lender, and Coindesk, a media and events business covering digital currencies that each year produces Consensus Invest. Barry, welcome inside the Ice House. Thanks for having me. When it comes to Bitcoin, how tempted are you at any particular night with your iPhone in your hand and the Twitter app open to tap it, I told you so? <laughs> Look, it's been quite a journey. When I started buying in 2012, didn't tell my wife about it, you know, nibbling, buying, you know, pieces of Bitcoin here and there off of this uh, exchange in, uh, in Japan called Mt. Gox. And eventually I told my wife, <laughs> Hey, we now own five or ten thousand dollars <laughs> of uh, of uh, you know, virtual fake money. Um, Priced at what per Bitcoin at that? Uh, I was about eight dollars. Oh my god! Yeah, and you know the price went up. I think maybe to like fifteen, and my wife thought I was really smart, and then the price fell down to five, and <laughs> uh, maybe not so much anymore. But uh, over time, as the price you know continued to go up, I just wouldn't stop talking about it. It, it was it was one of those things where if you if you knew me at the time, uh, you know, 2012, 2013, my employees at Second Market, my friends, my family, it just became a, a passion. Like most people who get excited about Bitcoin, it becomes a real passion for them. How did you find this virtual thing priced at eight dollars a coin? From Mount Gox. I mean, how did, what was the first moment that you stumbled upon this thing in 2012? Well, you know, I think everybody who gets involved in Bitcoin, they have an interesting journey. And so for me, 2011 is actually when I when I first heard about it. And if I remember correctly, it was, I think there was a Wired article that came out. I think it was about Silk Road, this marketplace where you can go buy drugs and <laughs> you know, other bad things. And that wasn't <laughs> what, what drew me to it. And I had just read a book by Charles Hugh Smith, a really interesting author, and the book was uh, called An Unconventional Guide to Investing in Troubled Times. And at the time, this is 2011, I, I was really convinced that we were not through the, the whole credit crisis. I thought that we were going to have another leg down. Because I'd also read, I think it was The Great Crash by Galbraith, which talked about, you know, in the, in the 40s, it was just, you know, everybody thought that we were out and then another leg down. Everybody thought we were out another leg down. And so I, I was just convinced that we were going to have another leg down in the market. Obviously, I was, I was wrong. But I, so I was very, very open, very receptive to the idea of um, asset classes that would, that would you know, theoretically perform well in periods of economic dislocation. And so I saw this Wired article. I read this book by Charles Hugh Smith. Hugh Smith. But for me, it was about nine months of being a skeptic. I mean, I, I just, I, I said, you know, Bitcoin, super interesting. It's, it's similar to gold, but it's, it's digital. And, um, you know, my, the questions that I, you know, had to have answered, like everybody was, you know, could it be shut down? Is the code real? Is this only being used by, you know, drug dealers and bad people. And, you know, over the next nine months, I became a bit of a student about money and the history of money. I became, uh, at the time, a bit of a believer in gold, actually, and then started slowly buying it. The more I dug in, the more I came to appreciate that it's truly transformative. It's going to change the way that financial markets work. So if you can fast forward to 2018, what was going through your head last Christmas when it almost dipped below 3000 I mean, you're into it for $8 a coin, so you're okay. But I'm reading about Neil Armstrong talking about history 50 years ago this month in the lunar module as it descended toward the moon. His heartbeat elevated briefly, but then returned to this absurdly low resting rate as he approached the lunar surface. If you were connected to an EKG last December, would there have been any unusual flutters? Not there? at all. Cool as a cucumber. And the reason why is Bitcoin has now gone through five 80% drawdowns in price. And in the previous four, the price hit an all-time high after it recovered. And so, you know, look, after the, the first one, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, scary. The second one, uh, you know, you wonder, you know, is it going to come back like the last time by the third and then the fourth? You're, you're buying. And so, you know, in the... In the depths of the crypto winter, we were buying Bitcoin, we were investing in companies, we were, you know, investing in entrepreneurs and, and you know, look, it's, we're not back at the all time highs, but if history is any guide. So one of the companies that is under your umbrella at DCG is Grayscale Investments. And the journal story over the weekend that I referenced said, and I quote, 
Grayscale Investments is one of several firms or groups that have pushed to be listed by a major U.S. stock exchange. Thus far, the SEC hasn't granted approval to any of them. Why the reticence and what needs to happen? Well, you know, the SEC has a, um, look, they have, they have a tough job here. And, you know, the issue is you have 70-year-old rules in the 33 and 34 Act that are, you know, constantly needing to be updated and modernized. And, and here we have a new asset class that, you know, is not you know, really equity-like, it's not fixed income-like, it's not currency-like, it's not precious metal-like, it's kind of all the above and none of the above. And so I think that you know the SEC look they've they've been they've been thoughtful, they've been methodical as to how they've been approaching the um, the whole Bitcoin ETF opportunity, and we've had we've had many 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 meetings and calls with the staff, and and I think at this point it's fair to say it's not a matter of of if but when, and uh, you know if if you listen to the you know public commentary being put out by the by the you know the, the chairman and the and the commissioners. I think the focus right now is around market surveillance, uh, you know, making sure that, you know, no uh, no sketchy activity with the way that the underlying assets trade relative to the ETF. And then I, I definitely think that there's a real desire to make sure that the price that the ETFs trade off of is based on exchanges that are deemed to be, you know, regulated and well run, which is certainly one of the reasons why I'm, I'm really excited about what, what ICE is going to be doing this year. You know, is it a 2019 approval from the SEC? You know, probably not. But is it 2020, 2021? I certainly hope so. I want to talk about some of the latest headlines that have been coming out of the crypto space. As of last Friday, David Solomon at Goldman Sachs was hinting at a crypto launch. JP Morgan's Jamie Dimon, of course, acknowledged that the threat of competition from cryptocurrencies is real. And KKR's Henry Kravis is said to have invested in a cryptocurrency fund offered by Parify Capital. You've been tweeting over the last few days your amusement, if I can call it amusement, over some of these stories. And do I have that right? Amusement, you wrote, come on in, the pool is warm. Yeah, it's complete validation. I think it's a recognition that digital assets are here to stay as an asset class. I think it's a recognition that it's clear that money is going digital. Um, and it's clear that in the future, physical cash is going to go away. And it's, you know, it's also clear based on history that fiat currency tends to not exist into perpetuity. The average life of a fiat currency over the past 500 years is 27 years. So what that means is on average in 27 years, a government will destroy their currency or the value of their currency, typically through debasement or through war. And, you know, I'm certainly not suggesting that, you know, Bitcoin is going to displace or replace the U.S. dollar, not going to re replace the euro or the yen anytime soon. But if you look around places like Venezuela and, and you know, Argentina and, and all these countries around the world, um, it's clear that something other than the local fiat currency would have real demand and real appeal. So I think when you see JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs or Facebook or any of these folks, you know, getting involved in kind of creating a digital form of money, it really just kind of points to where things are going in the future, which is non-fiat, distributed, decentralized digital forms of, of money. There's been a lot of talk about what's driving the most recent volatility from trade talks with China to, as you mentioned, Facebook's announcement of Libra. What do you chalk it all up to right now? It's a few things. One is, you know, as I mentioned before, if you look at the history of Bitcoin trading, 80% drawdown in price, all-time highs. And so I think once the market got comfortable that the that the lows were in, um, and so what seem it seems to have you know happened in the 3000s, it was really just a matter of when were we going to see the flows coming in, when were we going to see the momentum momentum come back, and you know once you kind of once the price recovered and got back to 4,000, 5,000, I think it brought some, some excitement and enthusiasm and some money back into the asset class. And then you had the macro events, you know, the China trade talks. But I, I think what's going to propel it forward, though, and I think what investors may be looking towards is, number one, in the second half of, of 19, there's going to be launches of some really, really important infrastructure and on-ramps. You know, Fidelity's launching an on-ramp. Um, there's lots of talk about Ameritrade and, and, uh, and uh, E-Trade launching an on-ramp. The backed effort is going to be really important. And then uh, I think a lot of investors who are um, familiar with Bitcoin also know that in 2020, there's a um, something called a halving event, which is essentially... Every four years, built into the code of Bitcoin, the inflation rate drops in half. 
And uh, and so what it means is on a you know daily basis, half the amount of Bitcoin that gets created today will get created a year from now. And that has happened twice before. And each time that that's happened in the past, the price of Bitcoin has gone up something like, you know, 500,000 percent afterwards. So really, the question is, is, you know, is it priced into the into Bitcoin? Well, it wasn't previously. And so if it's not priced in, the question is, when is it going to get priced in? And so I think I think that there's definitely some buying happening right now with with investors who see that happening next year. It's, I think it's May, May of, of 2020 and are trying to get into Bitcoin before everybody knows about uh, the halving. For those who listen to Barry Silbert in the first few minutes of our conversation and sit there in their cars, doing the dishes, mowing the lawn, and are entirely skeptical about everything that you are saying, talk to me about the five phases of Bitcoin acceptance. So phase one is dismissive. You hear about Bitcoin and uh, you say, that's just, that's stupid, that's silly, that's Ponzi scheme, tulip bubble, that's right. Some rat of these poison. gold bugs who've been tweeting at you over the last Indeed. few Indeed. Although, you know, a number of gold bugs are Bitcoin fans, but, uh, you know, it's the rat poison comment is dismissive. Phase two is skeptical. So these are people who actually, you know, spent a little bit of time, you know, going beyond the headlines and understand the, the basics, but say there's no way that's going to work. You know, I can see I can see why it might be interesting, but it's not going to work. Then you move to phase three. Phase three is intellectually curious. So this is where you start to say, well, you know, why is why is Bill Miller of Leg Mason excited about this? Why is Mike Novogratz excited about this? Why is Jack Dorsey excited about this? Why is Elon Musk excited about this? And you start to dig in, you start to ask questions, and you start to learn. And then you move on to phase four, which is which is a believer. You know, if you're an investor, that's when you write your first check and buy your first Bitcoin. And then some of us. Some of us move on to phase five, and that's that's evangelism. And that is running around, educating, spreading the news, spreading the gospel, and explaining to everybody around the world why Bitcoin is an amazing innovation that, if successful, is going to be fantastic for society. Evangelism. I never would have thought that I might label CNBC's Joe Kernan with that label, but I want to hear a little bit of a commentary that he made last week on the air. Only Bitcoin is corporate is currency for people for the people for the people themselves. I'm feeling like a you know like an evangelist almost. But is that wrong? That, that this looks like it's all about uh, the money. And I don't know who who made Facebook. Uh, who put Facebook in charge of of giving currency to the rest of the world? Some social media site. Why should they be the ones in a position to dictate, you know, how digital currency works? So you basically copped to being a, a phase five evangelist. He did, although over Twitter, uh, he, he reversed and he said he's actually only phase four right now. But we'll, we'll get him to five. Not bad for Kernan. I mean, that's the, really, the, you know, you'd think, well, he'd he went a, from, he'd think he'd have a couple gold bars in the safe at home. I feel like he went from one to four in the course of about three weeks. Speaking about going from one to four in the course of three weeks, I do think there was an inciting event. I'm not sure it was completely your advertising campaign, which we're going to get to. But let's go back a few weeks ago and hear a little bit from Brian Kelly, also on CNBC, on the day that Facebook announced Libra. Facebook going full crypto, unveiling its new digital currency, Libra, today, the start of what the social giant calls the Internet of Money to rebuild a reliable and global financial infrastructure. But our resident Bitcoin baller, Brian Kelly, says it's not exactly a cryptocurrency. He's over at the plaza with a little crypto class. BK, take it away. Yeah, sure. So let's get into this. This is not to, to put down Libra. I think this is a huge step forward for the entire space. But let's just look at how this works and what you're getting into if you're going to do Libra. OK, so how does it actually work? What are the mechanics? First thing you do is exchange dollars, yen, euro, whatever the basket's going to be for your Libra token. So Facebook gives you a Libra token in for your dollars. So Facebook is now holding your dollars. You have to trust Facebook that they're going to hold on to those dollars. They're going to keep track of the ledger and that your token's going to be worth something. Barry, you wrote of the launch, it will be remembered as just as important and transformative as the launch of the Netscape browser. What do you make of Libra? So if you remember the internet, you know, back in the in the nineties, uh, when you were driving Robert Reich around <laughs> Atlanta, right. 
<laughs> um, and you know, I was at, I was at school at Emory, and you know, I think the Netscape browser had um, had had recently come out, and and we as college students were for the first time, you know, getting on the World Wide Web. And and prior to that, it was um, it was the internet was a really hard concept to grasp, and and its utility was unclear. And if you look at the impact that Netscape had on awareness and accessibility and utility of the internet, it was it was transformative. And and I think Libra, you know, the currency itself, I'm not sure it's gonna you know last. And I'm I'm not sure that you know as an investment, there's a there's a separate token that they have like a security token. I'm not sure that that'll be a great investment. Not saying it won't be, but. But what what I do know is if the, the the Libra, I think they call it an association, can get it off the ground, it is going to put in the hands of billions of people around the world a digital asset wallet. And that digital asset wallet initially presumably would be used for, for Libra, but it won't it won't end there. It will serve as the launch will serve as a catalyst for infrastructure build. It'll it'll all around the world, the on ramps and the off ramps will, will be built, the tools will be built. Developers will build on top of it, and and you know o- over some period of time, the 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 general consuming public will come to appreciate the the power of frictionless movement of money cross border without having to rely upon you know middlemen and paying exorbitant fees, and and so over time I I do think that it's going to open up the floodgates to different types of digital assets you know whether it's people buying Bitcoin because they want to have the digital gold analog or if people want to buy in-game tokens that are now tradable or if they you know want to buy you know Ethereum because they want to run a smart contract Libra is going to be an enabler of all that. The general consuming public is one audience, regulators are another. Coindesk reported a few weeks ago that House Financial Services Committee Chairman Maxine Waters had asked Facebook to halt development of the Libra until hearings can be held. You replied that this really makes me appreciate just how unstoppable Bitcoin truly is. So I've seen all the skepticism surrounding Libra as it's predicted that Facebook will face this long path filled with regulatory scrutiny from Capitol Hill especially given their struggle over security and privacy issues. Regulatory approval is a huge issue for innovators in the digital asset space. For the average listener, what are governments worried about? Well, I think, one, governments are worried about the use of all different types of technology for you know, terrorist or money laundering type activities. And that's obviously a valid concern. I think, two, governments are concerned about investor protection and consumer protection. Which again, I think is 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 completely uh, valid and important. And three, I think over time, governments will start to become a bit concerned around the let's call it the competitive threat of uh, non-fiat currency and the impact it'll have on their ability to um, to control and influence you know fiscal policy, monetary policy. And look, I, there's there's lots of schools of thought as to whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. If you take the power out of central banks to try to stimulate or slow down an economy, I think within the within the the, the, the Bitcoin circle, uh, there's a you know the, tends to be more libertarian, tends to be you know more focused on you know Austrian schools of economic thought versus Keynesian. But look, I think we're pretty far off from, from uh, you know, Bitcoin being a competitive threat to, uh, to, the, uh, to the Federal Reserve. So, Barry, companies like Facebook and Goldman Sachs have ready access to cash to fund their projects for as long as they take to build. But anyone who follows the crypto press knows that there's hundreds, maybe thousands of others ideas out there that are germinating. How is the funding and cash burn rate of this space, given how delayed some of these projects are? A lot of projects raised money uh, in, uh, let's call it 17 and early 18, uh, via a mechanism called an ICO, an initial coin offering. And I think at the time when it was happening, we we steered clear because, for the most part, most of these projects, uh, projects that were raising money, were creating these tokens that it was definitely unclear to us that the tokens ne- even needed to exist. And so it kind of felt like us, felt to us that, that these were um, essentially kind of fundraising uh, efforts, uh, which meant that, you know, for the most part, they were security offerings. And it was our expectation that the SEC was not going to like that. And so that that source of funding, you know, all but came to an end towards the latter half of, uh, of 2018. And so kind of where we sit today in 2019, are, there's very few projects that are now raising money via these token offerings 
there's a, a new wave of companies that are essentially trying to tokenize their equity, kind of creating these so-called security tokens, which I, I think look, I think it's interesting. I think uh, you know the idea of removing friction in the capital markets, you know whether it's you know making it easier to trade or to clear and settle. I think that's interesting. I'm not necessarily a big believer in the idea that by just recording the ownership of an equity on a blockchain that that makes it all of a sudden more <laughs> you know more liquid or more valuable. But I, but I do I do commend the experimentation and I do think what'll likely come out of it is a new capital formation process which is going to be one that's global in nature. So you're going to be able to invest in ideas and projects all around the world. I believe it's going to be a capital formation process that's going to be accessible to a, to a broader group of investors. You know, in the markets today in the, in the U.S., you know, there's a bifurcation between people who are rich and people who are not. And I do think that this is going to lead to um, a greater opportunity for all investors. And, and I also I'm hopeful that um, it's also going to create a more liquid market for, let's call, you know, non-public companies. You know, there's unfortunately just too few companies going public today. And there's a, there's a real demand from investors to participate in earlier stage opportunities in businesses. And until such time as I think there's some rule changes that happen you know, at the SEC, I think the, 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 the public markets, you know, kind of the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ and others are going to continue to be the place where you know, multi-billion dollar companies go. But I want to I go to the place where you can invest in a company that's worth 50 million, 100 million. Right. I mean, in the here and now, you are investing in a hundred and how many companies right now? Hundred and one forty-five now. Hundred and forty-five companies. You've got more people lining up outside your boardroom waiting for a hearing, whether they're ETFs or protocols, markets or developer teams. For those that have got their money but are burning it pretty fast, how is the funding for these high-quality teams holding up? I, I would say, like. You know any you know any any venture market it ebbs and flows. I I, I I would say that if the companies that we invested in, I think were for the most part smart about if they did raise money in the form of you know Bitcoin or Ethereum that they sold it for you know U.S. dollars and so you know, for the most part we don't see too many hitting a, hitting a cash crunch. But what's also really interesting and 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 I hope this does change, but we we we've really seen a drop off in new company formation over the past six months. Mm. Because in 17 and 18, you know, if you had a, like a, literally a, a PowerPoint with the word blockchain in it, you could go raise $5 million. And, and so that attracted you know, you know, both good and, and not so good entrepreneurs. But over the past six months, there, there's actually um, there's fewer companies getting started. And, and I think part of it is um, a lot of the you know, early wins, early ideas have been pursued. And part of it is you know, during the crypto winter, you know, if you're working at Facebook or Google or have a you know, high paying job somewhere, the idea of leaving that job to go start a company and raise money in, a, in the midst of a, of a, of a crypto winter you know, it wasn't very appealing, I imagine. We talked about the smaller companies. We've talked about Facebook. But do you expect the rest of the FANG stocks, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, to unveil their own digital currencies, like Armstrong going to the moon? Is this a race to be first? Well, that's a fantastic question. And it's it's one that I've been asking. Uh, if you look at the uh, the initial formation group of Libra, you noticeably a- absent were the banks. And absent was Google. Absent was Apple. Uh, Amazon. And uh, so I do think that the banks are going to respond in some way. Maybe they hook up together. Maybe they hook up with another technology company. I think Google responds somehow, some way. Uh, I don't think they want to see a, a Facebook-led effort transform the way that advertising is is uh, monetized on the internet. And then, you know, Amazon and Apple are, are both, they, they can be kingmakers. And so, you know, there's going to be I think teams getting formed. Diving into Grayscale Investments, explain for our listeners how Grayscale operates and what your mission is. So Grayscale is a, uh, a manager of 10 different crypto funds. Uh, nine of those funds uh, enable investors to invest in just single currencies. So there's a Bitcoin fund and an Ethereum fund and an XRP fund. And the 10th fund is a, is a large cap fund that uh, enables investors to invest across the largest cryptocurrencies. And so what's really unique about the model is as opposed to a, a a traditional ETF, which which you know requires a uh, SEC approval uh, in order to start raising money and start existing, we raised we started all of our funds essentially as private 
vehicles, private funds, where initially institutions and high net worth investors couldn't invest in those vehicles. And then after they've been around for a period of time, we've then gotten them quoted on the public market, on the OTCQX market. Of the 10 funds, three of them are now publicly quoted. Mm. And the Bitcoin fund being certainly the, the largest and most well-known and, and, um, and the most liquid. But it's our expectation that over the next 12 months, you know, we'll, we'll get um, most, if not all, of the other 10 funds publicly quoted as well. As I mentioned in the intro, Barry, you've got a bone to pick with gold. Here is the President of the United States, Richard Nixon, on August 15th, 1971. The strength of a nation's currency is based on the strength of that nation's economy. And the American economy is by far the strongest in the world. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. President Nixon making an early defense of fiat currencies against gold. Give us a history lesson. At least gold makes some good jewelry. <laughs> so, well, let's, let's first talk about what is money. Money is nothing more than what society decides it is. So over history, money has taken lots of forms. Money has been rocks, it's been salt, it's been wampum, it's been squirrel pelts. And, uh, you know, for a period of time, uh, you know, precious metals, gold and otherwise served as a, as a medium of exchange. And then we moved into, uh, into, into, you know, paper representation of money. And then we moved into digital representation of money. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, in, in the future, it's going to be digital and it's going to be what society decides it's going to be. And you know, gold has played an important part uh, from a cultural significance perspective, um, and you know, certainly from a historical perspective, as a form of or a store of value. But I think what many gold investors don't seem to appreciate is that the next generation of investors, the next generation of asset allocators, do not view gold the same way that our parents or grandparents did. And I think part of it is due in large part to that clip that you just played. Um, if you were, you know, born, you know, in the in the '70s, um, you didn't grow up on the gold standard, and so there was never this belief ingrained in you that you know gold had some, you know, kind of uh, you know mythical value, government supported value. And then also, fortunately, if you you know were born in the '70s, you never you didn't grow up and didn't have a direct exposure to you know war and to, and to you know situations where you had to be able to you know keep and store value you know outside of the system. And so for younger investors, they view gold as you know kind of our our grandparents you know way of of storing money, and they dismiss it. They dismiss it outright. And, and so, you know, if over the next couple of decades, there's estimated $68 trillion of wealth that's going to be handed down. That's just in the U.S. So $68 trillion of wealth is going to be handed down from baby boomers to Gen X and Gen Y and millennials. I'm absolutely convinced that whatever of that $68 trillion is currently in gold, it's not going to stay in gold. I'm not saying it's going to go on to Bitcoin, but I, I know it's not going to stay into gold. And so if gold s stops performing the way that gold investors think it should in periods of high inflation or macroeconomic you know, dislocation, I think, it's, I, I think it's game over. I think, it's, I think, I think investors, the next generation of investors are going are gonna to put their money elsewhere. In May of this year, Grayscale Investments, of which you are the founder and CEO, launched this national multi-million dollar marketing campaign called Hashtag Drop Gold. I want to take a listen to your TV commercial. Why did you invest in gold? Are you living in the past? In a digital world, gold shouldn't weigh down your portfolio. You see where things are going. Digital currencies like Bitcoin are the future. They're secure, borderless, and unlike gold, they actually have utility. Leave the pack behind. It's time to drop gold. Go digital. Go grayscale. 
Drop Gold. What our listeners can't see, Barry, is a man and woman racing around what appears to be Wall Street, weighed down by gold. Chaos, of course, ensues. Tell me about the germination of this creative effort. So I, uh, I've always wanted to do a commercial or some type of campaign to start a conversation. And, and that conversation is uh, re- really, I think, to kind of highlight the, both the similarities of Bitcoin and gold, but also to start to uh, address the marketing efforts of the gold industry over the past 20 years and its a successful effort to kind of create this narrative for investing in gold that I think no longer no longer stands up. You know, gold today is invested in and bought by central banks and and lots of investors, but you know, look for the most part, you know, gold is used in the form of jewelry. Gold doesn't have much utility. Gold bugs will, will, you know, love to love to point out how it's used in electronics, but uh, the less uh, and less though. Less and less. It's down thirty percent over the past ten years. Whereas you know, iPhone uh, phone sales and iPad sales and computer sales are up to like ten x. So you know, there's a real there's a real disconnect there. And so, look, I, I think I think uh, you know what's interesting about Bitcoin versus gold is. As the price of Bitcoin goes up, it becomes more useful. It becomes more liquid. It becomes a better medium of exchange, and and it becomes a better store of value. Uh, whereas gold, as the price goes up, it becomes less useful. It you know you, you're you're going to use it less in electronics. It becomes harder to you know buy uh, or use for for jewelry. And so anyway, so so this 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 commercial this uh, advertising campaign. Uh, initially, it was to start a conversation, but uh, given the given the response that we've gotten from the gold industry and the gold bugs, we've already started producing commercials two and three because it's look it's it's, it's resonating. It's really resonating. You are though an investor. You don't strike me as like being in a Madison Avenue boardroom coming up with creative ideas. You've got Mark Murphy at the other end of the table. He's not the most creative type in the world. How did you actually go about the work? of coming up with something that would strike a smile in a lot of people's faces, but get to a real serious point. We did uh, what uh, any good CEO does and hire a fantastic, fantastic writer and producer uh, and director named uh, Brennan Stasewitz, somebody who I've known for for a very, very long time. He used to do commercials for uh, MTV and does a lot of uh, really, really awesome production work right now. So we, you know, we brought on Brennan and you know, look, the directive was let's highlight the lack of utility, the weight of gold in commercial one, you know, commercial two, three and, and beyond is going to play on a little more and, and, and talk a bit more about Bitcoin. What were the first signs that you got that said this piece is resonating and, I, and I'm beginning to get under people's skin? We launched it over the Internet first, and I think we got something like a million views in the first week, even before we started putting it on TV. It was clearly embraced by the Bitcoin community, and we then started hearing from the gold industry. And and very, very quickly, uh, the uh, the World Gold Council, which is kind of the it's the group behind the gold ETF and but miners and and uh, and you know gold gold producers, put out a blog talking about how you know gold's better than Bitcoin. We were, look, we were thrilled that they were engaging, and then there were a number of gold bugs who were on Twitter and started to engage. And we've been thrilled to see that the drop gold hashtag has continued to, to grow in, in use. And, you know, again, it, this is this was intended to be provocative. It was intended to be fun. It was intended to start a conversation. And that's a, exactly what what's happening. After the break, Barry Silbert and I talk about his foray into digital currencies and how they might change the future of IPOs. That's right after this. And now a word from Arthur Bergman. CEO of Fastly, NYSE ticker symbol FSLY. Fastly is an edge cloud platform. We help deliver digital experiences for amazing customers like Spotify and Ticketmaster and New York Times. We have started eight years ago. It's been an amazing journey. We work very closely with our customers. We're a very critical part in their business. We're very selective in type of customers we want in our network. Fastly is built by developers for developers. Fastly is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. 
Back now with Barry Silbert, founder and CEO of Digital Currency Group. We've been talking about Bitcoin's recent rise and fall in price and why investors should hashtag drop gold, according to Barry. As we begin the second half of our conversation, a big development in the digital asset space has its seeds right here. Intercontinental Exchange, the owner of the NYSE, has launched BACT. At your Consensus Invest conference last fall, BACT's CEO, Kelly Leffler, described for MIT's Michael Casey what BACT is trying to do. Let's take a listen. From, from when you were first pursuing this. When I think about what we're doing at BACT, what our peers in this space are doing, what all of you in this room are doing, I think about the headlines today. Will digital assets survive? And I'd say the unequivocal answer is yes. If you look at the price discovery process, I think that's what we're really focused on. The price is merely an expression of supply and demand. So take Bitcoin, a known supply, a variable demand. The price is being expressed, but there's a lot of missing infrastructure and use cases. And that's what we're doing it back to kind of backfill for this asset class that's grown so quickly. Barry Silbert, what have been the roadblocks to institutions embracing digital assets and how does BACT help solve that equation? I would say over the past couple of years, there's I think it started with awareness and education, which I think we're doing a pretty good job as an industry, creating awareness and bringing up to speed institutional investors. Up until recently, there have not been custody solutions that have checked all the boxes for an institutional investor. And you know, efforts like BACT and some others, you know, Fidelity and, and, and folks like that, I think are checking those boxes. For the average listener, why is custody important? Well, I think for institutional investors, it's from a legal and from an accounting and from a compliance perspective, there are strict rules around how assets are, are held for a, a fiduciary on behalf of their investors. And so, you know, you either you comply with those rules or you don't. And, and up until, you know, recently, there just weren't custody solutions that checked all the boxes. And then so, so you know, it's education, awareness, it's custody, and then it's the trading infrastructure itself. Um, you know, if you're going to be, you know, trading this asset class, institutional investors need to make sure that the technology is secure. They have to make sure that it's going to be up 24-7. They have to make sure that the people behind it are uh, fully compliant. And so we're, you know, we're now entering that phase. If you think about where the cryptocurrency Bitcoin space was in the summer of 17, Prior to that bubble, there was quite a bit of skepticism from the institutional community. There were not custody solutions. There were not the um, you know institutional grade uh, trading platforms. There was limited compliance software. There were questions around kind of regulatory status. All that's been addressed. All has been addressed. And so, really, I think it's it, we're, we're kind of entering a phase where the conversation when people talk about the digital asset class, it's not going to be you know as Kelly mentioned is, you know is it here to stay? Yes, it's here to stay. The conversation is going to be around, okay, what is the right allocation for an investor into this asset class and what is the best way to, uh, to deploy that capital? So institutions are one thing. On the other side of the coin, a common rap against cryptocurrencies is that you can't do anything with them. It's just about watching the price go up and down. The engines of commerce don't really run based on it. What needs to happen for everyday consumers to have something like a backed app on their phones so they can go out and buy a tall ice latte with it. There's a recognition in the crypto investing space that these different tokens have potentially different use cases and, and some are, in my opinion, more appealing than others. So, you know, Bitcoin is the digital gold analog. And something like, you know, Ethereum is the, you know, the token used to power smart contracts. And then you have tokens focusing on things around identity or provenance and things like that. So, you know, for, for people to start using cryptocurrency in their day-to-day -day activities, it's got to be easy to use. And so you need really good products. You, really, you need really good, uh, you know, consumer-friendly interfaces. And then you need to say, solve a problem. And I think, you know, here in the U.S., being able to pay for your, your latte is not too difficult to do. You have lots of options available to you. I do think outside the U.S., I think that there's a tremendous opportunity for cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and others to be used by the underbanked and the unbanked. Uh, and I believe there's a big opportunity around uh, cross-border payments and remittance and, and removing kind of friction mm -hmm. there as well. And I think there's interesting opportunities around uh, like micropayments. And, and you know, what I'm excited about with, with Libra and some of these others is the ability to disintermediate 
a lot of the friction, a lot of the cost associated with, with payments. So if, you know, if, if you're able to bypass the credit card networks, if you're able to bypass the banks, you know, if that merchant can save 5% and can you know, avoid the, the cost of chargebacks and fraud, there's, there's a lot of savings. And, and I think once those merchants start to pass those, those savings back onto the consumer, I think people will start using cryptocurrency more. This hidden 5%, 3%, whatever it is, Mark Murphy and I work for one of the big payments companies for a long time. There's The banks are taking their cut. Everyone is in this process that creates this friction. How aware is the general public when they actually buy a $7 latte that says, Three percent of that is taken right out of the system and going to intermediaries. So they don't they're not aware and they don't care. They just want to be able to buy their latte. I do think though that once everybody is buying their latte with a digital wallet, whether they're, you know, using uh, MasterCard or Visa or whatever, if you're then given the option, pay with crypto and you get to pay, you know, six dollars and seventy cents versus seven dollars with your MasterCard, I think people will um, say, well, well, that's interesting. You know, how, how do I save? Why do I save 30 cents here? And if you have a wallet that's holding digital US dollars and holding Bitcoin and holding Libra and holding JP Morgan coin and holding all these other things, and it's as easy as, uh, you know, just hitting one button, I, I think that that's going to drive real, real adoption. So let's take a little step back. Right across the street, In his first message to Congress, President George Washington stated, and I quote, uniformity in the currency weights and measures of the United States is an object of great importance and will, I am persuaded, be duly attended to. He then ordered his Secretary of State, who is Thomas Jefferson, to create a plan for establishing uniformity in coinage, weights, and measures for the United States, which is later referred to as the Jefferson Report. It led to what's known today as the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the NIST, which is located just outside of Washington, D.C., in your hometown of Gaithersburg, Maryland. Were you interested in this stuff growing up? I was interested in the markets. I was interested in investing. I was interested in uh, trying to make money. How? Was, Why? Why were you interested in all this stuff? Um, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I've always been entrepreneurial. I was always- your dad, the, mom, dad entrepreneurs? No. No, uh, no. I, I was always the kid with the the side job, the summer job. I was the kid. Um, what was your most profitable side summer job? Baseball cards. Yeah. We yeah. had John Arnold, who made a killing in arbitrage of hockey cards. That was my first exposure to um, you know to a to a to a market and a fairly fairly inefficient market at that actually. And then the bottom fell out of out of that market. But um, I was excited about investing early on. I ended up during school. I was working at uh, I worked at Bear Stearns. I worked at Smith Barney. I did banking after graduation, and then you know eventually the uh, the desire to to start a business you know was something I wanted to pursue, and you know started my last company, Second Market. Before we got to second market, though, you invested your bar mitzvah money in stocks and even landed a part-time job at a brokerage firm in D.C. to pay by your junior year in high school. What were the influences that drew you to putting your Hanukkah gelt into equities instead of a pair of walkie-talkies? I, I think it was a fascination with you know stocks. It, look, it's a bit of a, a puzzle. It's a bit of a game, and you know your success or lack thereof is you know measured daily at, at 4 p.m. And um, I think you focused I, on a small little basket or a lot of different stocks. I, you know, I, I started doing. I, I think mutual funds was the, some of the first investments I made, and then that became boring. And then I tried options, and I'm sure I lost my shirt. Then got involved in stock picking, and and I came to be you know quite successful at at finding and picking relatively like lower cap, small cap companies that were less liquid and taking, you know, for me, what were kind of relatively big stakes and then waiting. And, uh, you know, I had uh, I had some pretty big, pretty big wins for, uh, you know, for for a high school and college kid. I mean, by 17, you'd pass the series seven exam, becoming one of the youngest people ever to pass the exam. You graduated from honors from Emory's Gozietta Business School in Atlanta with a degree in business administration, spent five years at investment bank Houlihan Loki. And by your second year there, you were you joined the financial restructuring division, working on bankruptcies that rocked the early 2000s, including Enron and WorldCom. What were some of the biggest lessons you learned in this phase in banking and, and frankly, restructuring? The perils of over leverage. Uh, you know, we got involved in these situations after these companies had, had imploded. 
so you know really learned how the financialization uh, or securitization and leverage can be used for both kind of you know the good and bad as a banker you get involved in lots of different industries you get lots of get involved in lots of different transactions it was a blast learning about the way that different businesses were run it was a blast learning about how they were financed it was a it was a, a lot of fun you know working through these restructuring deals where it was you know complex negotiations between companies and creditors and all these different stakeholders and i learned a lot but but you know after 5 years of doing it i felt like i'd seen it all and and i was ready for the next challenge and that next challenge was second market and several years into your run running second market you asked your board to spend 3 million dollars of the company's cash to buy bitcoin which was unrelated to the core business and one of your board members Lawrence Lenahan was quoted as saying i thought it was absolutely crazy how did you convince them that it wasn't it was a process while my board was certainly super excited about the second market business that we were building I think they sensed in me a, a passion about Bitcoin that they had not seen probably since they had first met me when they invested in second market. So I don't know exactly what it took uh, other than saying, you know, guys, you know, give me a shot. Trust me. And um, yeah, I think that I think that three million today is worth one hundred and fifty million. Yeah, I read somewhere is two hundred million yeah. so that the board can rest easy. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so how did that morph it then into the creation of Digital Currency Group? And what was your thinking to say second market has been a great run, but this is the core of what I need to be doing now? It's an interesting story because so I was buying Bitcoin in 2012. Then I started doing angel investing in the Bitcoin space, 2012, 2013. And, and in 2013 is when I went to the board and said, OK, I, I love this Bitcoin thing. Let's do something. And, and that was when we decided to launch the, the Bitcoin trust. And we launched it while I was still running Second Market. So we launched the Bitcoin trust. And that would have been like, the, I think, September of 2013. It was very well received. We raised a lot of money. And we were taking in so much money that we had to set up a trading desk to go buy Bitcoin. So again, this is all still under second market. So we had the Bitcoin trust business. We had the Bitcoin trading business on the side. I was doing my angel investing. I was buying Bitcoin. And I, you know, one day I, you know, I, maybe it wasn't one day, but I, you know, I just said, look, this is, this is what I want to pursue. This is what I want to, this is what I want to do with my life. I want to, I want to try to make this Bitcoin thing a thing. And so I, I told my board that I think it was time for me to step down running second market. We had a fantastic COO in place at the time that we, uh, elevated to CEO. And, and the plan was we were going to spin out second market and then, and he was going to run it. And then I was going to, we were going to merge the Bitcoin trust business, the Bitcoin trading business, and uh, my angel investments into a company. And coincidentally, NASDAQ called and said, we love the second market business. They had tried to launch something called uh, the NASDAQ private market, which uh, my sense was it wasn't getting a lot of traction. So the timing was perfect. So we sold, we sold second market to NASDAQ and then essentially just combined all of my Bitcoin activities into um, what became Digital Currency Group. People have compared Digital Currency Group to Berkshire Hathaway in the digital asset space. Does the strategy of an old timer like Warren Buffett have a lot to teach relative newcomers like Barry Silbert? Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> Despite the fact that he um, you know, craps on Bitcoin every opportunity he gets, I, I do think that you know when I structured DCG, um, I, I thought long and hard about how I wanted to set it up. And I chose to set it up as a company as opposed to a fund because I, I came to appreciate the, um, the value of permanent capital. And so that's something that you know, Berkshire Hathaway has, which is you know, the ability to make investments with very, very long-term uh, investing time horizons. I think you know, Warren Buffett, you know, he's an investor in people. I think that, uh, that's something that, that I've you know, tried, to, tried to learn to do uh, over the years as well. And so, you know, look, strategic, long-term capital, permanent capital, long-term thinking, backing people, being patient. And, you know, we don't trade, uh, we don't short, uh, we don't use leverage. We're really just trying to back the best entrepreneurs out there. We're trying to deploy our capital in ways that we think will outperform, you know, kind of the market, in this case, you know, Bitcoin being the market. And at one point down the road, um, you know, maybe I'll take a public. So as we wrap up, where do you see Bitcoin and cryptocurrency industry heading, let's say, over the next five years? 
Well, we're going to um, see some real innovation around the use of blockchain for non-financial use cases. Uh, so things around making the financial markets more efficient on clearing and settlements. We're going to see some attempts to create efficiencies around uh, identity and ownership uh, around uh, rights, digital rights. We're going to see improved infrastructure around the on-ramps and the off-ramps of the asset class. We're going to see the asset class itself you know, grow well beyond the, I think it's about $300 billion today. I think it's, you know, in the next five years, it'll capture a, a meaningful portion of the $8 trillion gold market. And I think we're going to see some interesting capital formation models emerge around the world, hopefully in the U.S., but certainly around the world, around mechanisms to invest in people's ideas and projects that are, um, that are blockchain-based. And that's your prophecy for 2024. I hope we'll see you before then for your IPO, but if not, let's come back then and test the hypothesis. Excellent. Thanks very much, Barry, for joining us inside the ISS. Thank you for having me. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Barry Silbert founder and CEO of Digital Currency Group. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Teresa DeLuca and Pete Ash with production and editing from Ken Abel and Ian Wolf. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 